Let's try this. Still no? Hang on a second. We'll let this kick on and see. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and type in here. I think we got it now. Let's try this. There we go. Ah, right, now we got sound. And we're live. Hang on. Let's uh let's start over. Let's see, I'm, I'm gonna ready. Type in here. Uh, let me turn my sound on this one down. All right, how about we do the reset? You ready? Yeah. Good. All right, stay. Thanks for everybody tuning in and hanging on. So here, let's do like th three, two, one, and reset. Hey, welcome to Real Talk, Real Unfiltered Talk with James Bryant along with Dion Hibden. Hey, Dion, how you doing tonight? I'm doing wonderful. So for all of you that can lip sync, you caught the first couple minutes, which is great. <laughs> but um, we talked about a whole lot of cool stuff, and we're never going to talk about it again. So um, welcome to the show. It's our third episode only. Um, I was just discussing that our sound was horrifically bad. We purchased new equipment. It was supposed to be delivered today. It didn't make it, and I'm really sorry about that. But it's on the way. It'll be here tomorrow. So the sound's going to be really loud and probably nasty, but bear with us. It's going to be a lot better next week. It'll get how, better. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I it, mean, really, having a good day. Having deja vu? <laughs> yeah, a little we just, bit. We just had this conversation. Um, so we got, a, we got a viewer email, and I want to share it with you really quick. On last week's, ep last week's episode, we were talking about your dad, Guido Hibden, and uh, I'll condense it down this time, but... Um, a great fisherman on the Lake Terry McDaniel sent a letter, uh, an email to us, and he said he had a, a story to share. And basically what he said was that he had a battery issue, and Guido stayed 30 minutes after his own takeoff to try to help him get his boat fixed, and uh, still went out and fished the tournament, and gave everyone a 30-minute head start, and ended up finished second in the tournament. <laughs> and he said, I, I knew he was a great fisherman, but that day he said, I learned he was a really good guy too. Oh, yeah. And so it's really nice to hear other anglers tell those stories that, you know, that we're not just making it up. Your dad was a really class act, cool guy. And I have seen him mad a few times too. So oh yeah, you know, we've seen it on there. Yeah, on he the wasn't good always side. he wasn't always that way. But <laughs> but yeah, he could he he wanted everybody to have a good time. You know, there's probably nothing irritated him any more than to see somebody out there, you know, fighting, scratching, clawing to make a living at the, at our sport and not having a good time. You know, because he really felt like you know that was the whole key. You know, we got to fish for a living. Right. You know. Uh, you know, and he would be the first to tell you, hey, life ain't so bad. That's you're, right. going, you're going to catch a fish today. Everybody else is sitting in a cubicle somewhere, That's you right. know, and, and, and doing something that they might not love. And uh, yep. like, know, so. like he always told me, when you're out there floating and getting ready to fish a tournament, you've already won. That's right. Yeah, you're the rest there. of it's just, yeah, if you're there, you're there because there's people that are dreaming to want to do that. So yeah. super cool. Uh, moving into this week, let's go back to our unfiltered schedule. I like to tell a little industry news, kind yeah. of things out there. We were talking off the air earlier, and then on the air while we were muted, that uh, boat market's a little, you know, it's, it's March. It, we're getting into to mid-March. Um, everything's warming up. I think we're going to see things break loose. But we're kind of in that little awkward edge where the market's just kind of, we don't know if it's going to be good or bad or kind of what's going out there in the boating industry and the fishing industry. It's just a little slow for takeoff so far. Yeah. I think, I think things will pick up. I mean, you know, it... it and it's not just this part of the world or anything. I mean, it's just it's a little slow. You know, there's stuff so expensive nowadays, you know. And, and you know, you go to talking about people buying bass boats and, and, and stuff like that, you know, and gas and fuel. And, and, you know, a lot of people probably doesn't think that makes a huge difference, but it really does. You know, gas prices can really, you know, really hammer the market a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I just think everything's really expensive right this <laughs> day and age well i think i'll be the unfiltered guy today and um you know we're going to stay apolitical on this but i mean it sucks you know i hate high gas i like i like yeah. the 68 cent a gallon gas i like burning oil i like cheap cheeseburgers i like to go to the grocery <laughs> store and not every time i buy three items it's 70 freaking dollars yep. you know i i'm pretty tired of the whole damn thing honestly it's, it's i'm pretty sick crazy of it right now so you know my unfiltered side is i i hope that some something changes you know i'm I, I own a tackle store, you know. Yeah, absolutely. These guys are coming in, and, and they're going, damn, you know. I, and, and we talked about, I, I can't remember if we talked about it last week or not, but, you know, the, the fishing industry is kind of sneaky. 
you know, they just take less baits out of a bag and say, we never raise the prices. Yeah. But now we're getting to the point where they notice it because they're paying $2 a worm. Yeah. So it's just like groceries and everything else, and I think more people are going to be more conservative with their tackle this, this season before they go out and buy a whole bunch of it and fill up their boats like they normally do. Yeah, they're going to buy the colors they need, and that's going to be it. That's yeah. right. Chartreuse, black, blue, black, white, watermelon, red, watermelon, and green pumpkin. Oh, you even throwed watermelon in there a couple of times. Clear watermelon red oh. and watermelon. Oh, okay. That's two colors. Yeah, that's too many. Too many. What's your What's your top colors? Black, blue, and green pumpkin. That'll get you by. And that's central That'll United get... States, across country it, to country, coast and, to coast. And, and you need one plum color, kind of, for worms. As far as jigs and stuff go, no, green pumpkin, black, blue. That's about it. What is? We're getting off topic, but now I mind, still have to do now this. mind you, I sell. And and when I said that, uh, we sell our own jig, and we had to come up with like eight colors. And it took me and my two sons a month to come up with eight colors. And it's because we just don't use them that much. You know, we use two or three colors, and that's it. Right. Now, the, the problem, and, and again, I'm going to be like the turkey today, and I'm just going like to negate everything you say. I'm just going to argue about everything. The problem with your bait Okay. And this is very, see, he's getting all big eyed right no, now. For those of us who are like big eyes, like, I'm fixing to gonna knock him out of his desk right now. The problem with your baits is that you label them after I think your lifestyle. And I believe you guys are fighters. <laughs> oh, something absolutely. along the line. And you guys really are, are affectionate to tattoos apparently. <laughs> because you've got like you know, one of them's like called bar fight. Uh-huh. Is that right? And yep. I think that's the black and blue, right? Yes, sir. So it kind of makes sense. But yeah. there's one that's called like low back tattoo or low back tat. Oh, yeah, yeah. What the hell kind of color I'm relates to a tattoo? You, we, we thought we had is way it too much time. Is it or is it like J-Link? We had too much time to think about it, you know, and the guys were like, hey, we need to come up with some cool names. They and, are uh, cool names. I'm, giving are. You, I'm just giving you a hard time. But yeah. that's, you know, I, I wonder if you pick names because it's like, hey, I was I had a really bad night last night. I was at the bar. <laughs> I saw this chick with this tattoo on her back, and you know I'm, she was being all crazy. I'm and not going to say that hey, that is not how it happened. Low back tattoo, and it, and it, and my son got his ass kicked in the fight. So we're going to call it <laughs> bar fight or something along that it line. Could be. It of course, be. I don't think I've ever seen a hypnotist that took a whooping. So uh, not very often. Not, not very at often. least never admitted it. Right? I'm, I'm not saying I want to at this day and age. No, I don't want to anymore. But when we run out of ideas two or three years down the road, we'll be talking about the, the episodes where we fought as kids. We'll have a wrestling match. But we won't, we <laughs> won't do that tonight. Yeah, it's all cool. So anyway, <laughs> what are we talking about? The industry. The industry. I, yeah. I read, I, I have a favorite magazine that I get because I'm a, a tackle retailer. Mm-hmm. They actually, Bassmaster issues a separate magazine to tackle store owners. It's called Tackle Retailer. And um, I hate it. Um, it's not that good. Um, they they basically push all of the advertisers, the yeah. baits, and yeah. that's what they should do. I mean, you buy an ad, you get an article. Yeah. And just FYI, when you read an article in Bassmasters or FLW or MLF or QIC or whatever whatever kind of magazines out there, typically, and you might argue on that, but um, if they're if they're on an article and they're talking about a bait, odds are the next page there's an ad in it. So if you spend money and buy a big ad, ninety nine percent of the time you get the write up to. Yeah. So that's kind of how that works. It's, it's always been that way. I mean, you know, with everything, it is. the the bigger sponsors get their stuff printed more often, you know, and but they're actually spending money. They're buying that kind of advertisement, you know. So and that's what gets you sales. But, and that's totally fine. And I, and I can't say that you know, like good sports writers, you know, fib. They just are vague, you know, sometimes when it comes to putting something out there. Now I've been very fortunate, you know, in my career, you know, the stuff that I catch fish on has always been pretty popular, you know, and, and uh, so so they don't mind writing about it. But, you know, there's some of the little handmade stuff and stuff like that that, you know, really kind of goes unnoticed. Right, but they want to spend the money and get them Absolutely. a write-up, then that puts them, that'll put them on the map. You know, it's cool. But what, where I'm getting at is, take that all aside, they, they have some really cool articles that they talk about marketing, they talk about what's going on in the industry, and there's always like, you know, Bob Smith, which there's no Bob Smith, I'm making up that not, that name, but like Bob Smith, the new CEO of this tackle company, or yeah. Bob Smith is the new chairperson for this buyer's group for this. And it's kind of cool to read because every once in a while you'll see somebody you know that used to be a fisherman, yeah. maybe retired out, and now they're working for their corporation doing yeah, stuff. Absolutely. But I did see, um, let me see what issue, make sure I'm not like 10 years back, I'm too late on this. But it was no, March 2024. Nice. Okay. Uh, Rapala. Do you prefer Rapala or Rapala? Uh, I'm kind of a Rapala guy. Rapala. Okay, so we're going to say Rapala. Uh, Rapala, who also owns Suffix Line. They own, I think, Terminator. They own, um, let me think about it a minute. They've got their own tackle company. 
um, soft plastics. Is it Crush City? I think it's Crush City. It could be. Maybe. But they also have just acquired 13 Fishing. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. Now we're seeing 13 Fishing in part of the Rapala umbrella. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see what they do with that because I think 13 Fishing is mostly rod and reels. So probably keep your head up. You either see it just like it is or you'll see some Rapala branded 13 Fishing yeah. gear. So that's my industry news for this week, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I got to go fishing last weekend. I I went yesterday. Did you? So we can we can talk about for those that are uh, that are listening and driving down the road, or those that are watching live. We're we're here at the Lake of the Ozarks in Central Missouri. It's March, um, pre spawn conditions, yeah. and uh, we fished. Uh, and and well, I'll get to yours, but I get to go first because I I brought this up, so I get it. <laughs> um, I fished a fifty three boat tournament, a little club, and uh, we fished up the up the river, and uh, had a great day. Um, I caught two 12-inch fish. It was <laughs> awesome. But I got to fish with my dad, and it was good. Uh, he caught a 552. He caught several Kentuckys. Um, we could not finish the limit. We had four fish for about, I don't know, 11, 12 pounds, which is about what we always catch. Uh, it might have been 10 pounds. It, it wasn't that great, but it was a good day on the water. Um, he snagged a toad up, right up on the bank and some chunk rock on a main lake point, throwing a, a little jerk bait, uh, silver and black back, pink belly. Yeah. And uh, that fish was hugged really, really tight to the bank and just inhaled it. I mean, there was no question. Yeah. And um, I always kind of laughed because I think when people talk about bad net guys, um, I hit the fish with the net this time. <laughs> First time I think I've ever done it. And he, and he kind of jumped over it, and then he got my line all wrapped up, and I panicked. So I just I did what I call a reverse net. You ever done that? You flipped it over. I just flipped the net over and just scooped him the other direction and scooped there the other go. way. And I, the fish is in the boat. didn't matter, but... He got, I think, third biggest fish of the day. We got our entry money back. It was, it was cool. Yeah. But it, it seems like up, up river high this last weekend, the fish were very, very shallow. And um, we, can, we can talk about more about that in a little bit. But I think uh, you guys better pay attention because I think you're going to miss the spawn before you realize it was happening. It, it could happen early this year. Uh, I mean, we've had some good, you know, we've had some good warm days. But then again, like say three or four nights ago, it was down in the 20s again. Uh, so the water temperature did not come up very well, um, you know, but that's that's kind of where we're at right there. Uh, me and Lawson actually fished what they call the Angry Pirates yesterday, uh, which is just a fun deal. You know, a bunch of the locals get in on a Tuesday, and, and we go out there and we, we fish on Tuesday. Uh, and like I say, we didn't do very well. Uh, and I really think we got live scoped pretty hard. Um, live scoped. Well, two of the the scope heads got two, you. Two of the guys that are very good at it uh, won and finished second, and uh, we did not. Uh, we we caught three up shallow and and uh, and really didn't have many more bites. So I had the kind of day like you guys had on Sunday. Uh, it was just it was hard hard getting bit. Yeah, you know. Uh, we thought we were doing the right thing, and in the end, apparently we weren't. But but anyways, my, my favorite line when I used to call weights on the stage, I used to say to them when they had a bad day, I said, "You zigged instead of zag." <laughs> yeah, it's bad, and it, you know, and we're gonna we're gonna get into a lot of these facets of fishing. Um, that's gonna fall into probably decision making, sure. right? Absolutely. You know, and there's a lot. I mean, that's just figure that be chapter forty seven. But today, uh, today's subject matter we're gonna talk about is gonna be structure, and because we're coming off of pre spawn, those fish are out there staging, they're schooling up, and if I say something wrong, let me know. Um, because I'm not a great fisherman, I just read a lot. Um, those those fish stage up and then they start. They spawn, then they move back off, and they typically go to brush. Correct? Normal. Cover. Normally, yes, they go Nor to some form of cover. Yeah. Right. So t tonight, I want to touch a few things. The unfiltered discussion on what's the best structure that a bass is going to move to. Now, before we get there, let's give a little history of Lake of the Ozarks, okay? Because people don't know a lot about the history of the lake and how it was built. But what I want to tell everyone is this lake is very unique because during the Great Depression, they actually logged it. Yeah. They stripped it bare. There's still some standing timber out and standing timber out in some really, really deep water, and it's pretty cool, but everything else was barren. So the only structure that was put in this lake was what man put back in it after they drained it. Yes. Correct? Yep. So one of my favorite things that Dion says to me all the time about what bass like is... I... I, I think they like wood, but they they use the rock and stuff more than they do anything on Lake of the Ozarks. Basically, in a in an Ozark style lake, what are you shaking your head for? Because but, you're wrong. 
I'm wrong. Yeah, because that's not what you always tell well, let's me. Hear it. Let's you start out by saying bass like what where. Do you know? I'm 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 putting you on the spot because we didn't we don't we don't script this or talk about bass it. Bass like what where? Bass like cover. Where where does the bass like to be in cover? Where does he like his cover? Oh, a bass. Yeah. He likes it over his head. Ah, yeah, be, there we go. He's got to have something that he can tuck into. So tune in. Had me so throw for, all, for all you listening, it, this is very, very important. Bass likes be under something. Yeah. and it's number one, right? And got the it. neat thing about it is crappie and everything else that, res, that you know, use brush as cover We're gonna, are completely the opposite. I don't want to talk about crappie tonight. Well, I'm just saying. We have crappie episodes there's, coming. There's two there's two fish out there that we catch a lot of. And that really brush. And everything else doesn't care about brush. There's not another fish swimming in Lake of the Ozarks that gives a hoot and hell about brush. Right. So you're crappie, crappie and bass. And brush. And that's right. it. So and, and a and a big bass will stand around a pile of brush that's laying dead on the bottom. But if he can't get into it and tuck into it, he won't live there. You know, he likes to have something over his head. And, uh, and like I say, a crappie will stand on top of stuff and is just mm -hmm. as happy doing that. So now I've seen big, big bass hug next to like a lay down log. Absolutely. But that's still, it, I guess we're going to get to number two. Bass likes to have something over his head. Number yep. two, shade is the same as something over his head. Absolutely. So if shade. you have a tree that's above the ground and it's casting a shadow, he feels like he's under something. He'll lay in shade as well. Shadows so, just allows him to ambush his prey better, you know, because... He's dark colored and he stands in the shadows of those things. And when you know a shad or something comes by, he can lurch out there and get it. So we gotta switch gears. You gotta help me out with this one because this one's gonna probably have arguments over and over and over again. All right? Because gotcha. you said, "quote bass are dark." All right. So this time of the year, you hang a fish, you bring him up. He's stark ass white. All right. Why? Why is he white? And then the next one you catch, he's green as a as a Kentucky or a Cal. Uh, Florida strain bass. Water clarity now, makes a huge difference. There's, but you always hear what they say. I caught him out, out there. He come out of deep water, moved up. Yeah. That's not true, right? Uh, not necessarily, no. But, but I've heard it both but, ways, so I, and I'm sure we'll have But if one comes out of deep water, one. he's going to be a little bit paler than one that's up shallow, simply because he, he's been out there deeper where the light penetration is not there. Right. You know, so he's going to be a, a paler, more, you know, just white-looking fish. See, and so when they come in, that color pigment changes in their skin pretty quick, you know. Gotcha. See, I was always told that they have a bunch of, everyone has white fish, and they bring in the big green ones. It's because they were in a box somewhere, and they were cheating asses. <laughs> that could be, too. So I just wasn't too sure about that. So, and we're going to, I'm pretty excited, because I've been thinking about this really long and hard. And you know, we don't talk much about, like, where my mind is going. But <laughs> another right. one, I, I really want to do. keeps it interesting for me. I, I really want to do an episode on cheating. Really? And and I'm kind of, yeah, I'm really kind of, I'm torn on a little bit because you don't want to educate people on how to cheat. But on the same token, I think you need to educate people on what to look for when other people are cheating. Because it's a, yeah. it's a common practice out there. They all, Absolutely. They all it cheat. Hap it happens. You know, and, and those aren't fishermen. They're just bank robbers. What I call bank robbers are choosing a different bank. But I think we need to podcast on it and talk about that too because... There's some really cool cheaters out there. They do some really innovative stuff. Oh, there's been and, some elaborate stuff. Yeah, and I think it'd be like super cool to talk about. But what I'm telling you is I think we're going to have to like maybe invite only qualified people to listen to it because cheaters, you can't listen to the episode because <laughs> we're going to watch everybody that's tuned in and we're going to check on it. And if you catch you out there in a tournament, you win, uh, we're going to turn you in. My, my, dad used, my dad used to say it one way. He says, when you dangle $100,000 out there in front of somebody, oh, yeah, they're going to figure it out. Right. And, so I and it's it's scary to think that, but yeah, in this day and age, you know, people are hungry. They that's need right. The money. That's right. So we might do that down the road. There you like go. Around Christmas. Yes. And yeah. then you know, and because the, they're thinking about, well, that'd be a bad time too, because then they'll be <laughs> needing Christmas money, and they'll that's be right. trying to find some winter crop tournament and everything. steal on that. So anyway, back to structure. Sorry, we'll talk about cheating later. Um, just I'm kind of excited about. But anyway, um, bass likes to have some his head. Shade works. Crappie like. More of a bully kind of brush because they can get up in it, and well, I I just think I think a bass a bass doesn't like stuff touching him a lot, okay? Where a crappie doesn't necessarily like it either, but a crappie hovers around stuff most of the time. Uh, when you see crappie on a brush pile, a lot of times they'll be on top of it or to the sides of it. But when you and I'm going to go back to live scope here, 
when you see a bass on live scope, most of the time he's in the limbs and he's down in it. Mm-hmm. And and I think that just helps him to, like I say, ambush prey. Um, and, and like I say, there's two different ways to look at it. Uh, everything that I put in, I like to put stuff in where he can actually swim through it a lot of times or swim under it, you know. Uh, and that can be a little tricky to put in. But uh, but like I say, I think a big bass, to live on a spot, has to be able to swim under it and swim through it and stand in it. Uh, you know, like I say, a cedar tree, everybody thinks, oh, man, you take your Christmas tree and you tie it off to your dock, and that's immediately a great place to catch a bass. No, it's a good place to catch a crappie. Right. But it's not necessarily a good place to catch a bass because I think they want to be in it more than just around it. And uh, and so, therefore, I use stuff with big limbs on it, you know, stuff as big around as your arm. Um, but it still, it has to be up off of the bottom, elevated off the bottom a little bit so he can go back and forth under it. Now, is this pre, like, three months ago Dion arm or, like, today's Dion arm? Oh, you're, no. You've lost some weight, yeah, so. It, it, it can be a little so, stick now. A little stick. All uh, right. So maybe like four to four to six inches diameter. Big, every, bigger wood is what you're every, saying. Yeah, Hardwood versus soft wood. Yeah, Hickory, oak. I like, I, like water, kinda, I like water wood too. Water wood. Sycamores, so. willow trees, stuff like okay, that. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, so which like I don't think hardly any exist on the lake here. Well, there's still you just got to know where to look for them, but yeah, there's still some. Okay. But, so, but still, that's not as important. The only reason that willow plays a big part in me putting in brush is because normally when I put in brush, I want a fish to get in it immediately. You know, I, I don't want to wait six months for the green to fall off the limbs. I want a fish to be swimming in it 30 minutes after I put it in the lake. Green stuff, sycamore, willow, stuff like that, the leaves stay good in the water. Mm-hmm. Like when you sink them in the water, they stay good and green for a long time. Right. Uh, and so therefore, that means that that fish will get in there because brown leaves in the water kind of it's it's the same concept of photosynthesis that's a big word you didn't, big ass. You didn't think i was going to use that today did you rest yeah green grass wow you produces oxygen brown stuff in the water uses oxygen so therefore if it will stay greener in the water longer it's going to be better you know for the fish and the minnows and everything and basically, you're you're Mills giving. Minnows do like to stay in the water longer, <laughs> okay. but it it will they will stay closer <laughs> to something that's green in the water than they will something brown. I think you told me this once before, but I'm not going to give you credit for it. Um, did you get that? Yeah. I, oh, like, yeah. I heard yeah, you. You may have told me, but you you don't you don't get the credit. I I think that natural storms and natural things that when things fall in the water because they're green, that's what they relate to the quickest. Yeah. So I think those two things are parallel. You may have told me that, but I can't remember. It, but it, it just, makes it's just common sense. Yes, on it that. makes sense. You know, and then once they start to decompose, then you have the whole story about them giving off chemicals and all those kind of things, and the, the de- de- decomposition process. Leaves, leaves due to also lack of photosynthesis in the water create a whole lot more shade. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I did use it too. Yeah, we both used it. That's right. It'll be water. I do know what? how to spell it. You know, Amy, Amy, somebody, our tech girl says you guys know how to somebody, spell it. Now it's a spelling bee on Real and Filter Talk. We're gonna P H O T O S Y N T H E S I S. How do you think? Did I get it? She doesn't know. I think there's not an E in there, but I got it anyway. So I win, you lose. You're going to make us ban this deal from being visually watched by anybody. Right. So, hey, so let's, let's, I had a segue and we got sidetracked. Let's talk picnic tables. Picnic tables. Wow. Yeah. So. You did go to Kentucky Lake once, didn't you? I did. <laughs> yeah. I've been to Norfolk also. You I've, go to, I've been, I've been everywhere, man. You go to Kentucky <laughs> Lake and Kentucky Lake's one of our, one of the better structure lakes ever, uh, you know, and those fish get out there and they stay deep a lot of times. And and the crazy thing about it is you go to Kentucky Lake and you go into a uh, state park and you won't find a picnic table that isn't concreted into the ground or <laughs> a trash can. They're all gone because those guys steal them and drop them in the lake out there to hold a bass. Right. And because um, what's more perfect if, if the bass has to have something over his head that's than right. to have a picnic table a picnic sunk table off the perfect. point? That's, that's right. right. So everybody steals picnic tables at state parks, which I'm not encouraging you to do, <laughs> listeners. But awesome if your if your neighbor's a real turkey bird, steal his picnic table that's and right. sink it off his dock, and you can catch a bunch of fish. It's pretty awesome. It, it's 
it's the same rule of thumb on all of that stuff. You know, I, I have a probably my biggest theory on brush is the bigger it is, the more fish it holds. But you go through a pecking order. If there's too many fish in there, a big bass won't live there. And that's that's the next thing we're going to get to is we, we're going to talk about a dominant fish theory. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, if you're a hunter or if you're a fisherman or if you're um, a guy that likes to hang out at the bar a lot, you know, the, right. biggest, the biggest dude kind of rules the roost there until the small guy whoops him. In pecking order. That's right. And occasionally there's a small it does, but not typically. But the biggest deer, you know, it takes care of the girls. Is, that, right. is that the right? I don't, I don't deer He hunt, gets so. first dibs. Gets first dibs, and then he ruts everybody and bangs up their horns and shoves them out of the way, which is what is that the... It's the same way in bass rut. fishing. I, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced in it. We, we have to bring a deer hunter on. Anyway, yeah. so it, same thing with fish. The biggest, the biggest fish controls the, the area. Yeah. And if they're, you pluck one out, generally the next dominant fish is going to take its place. They're they're very territorial when it comes to any kind of cover they stand around. You know, they're not going to... Well, and, and the fact remains is the bigger they get, the lazier they are. That's and right. They, they don't want to have a lot of competition standing around them. So they pick something smaller and unique for them where they can still hide. And, and which, which is going to go into unfiltered tip number three. Don't sink a tree. I, I I don't sink many full trees. I mean, I sink limbs off of trees. And and the reason I do that, brush is not, for me, fishing tournaments, brush is not something that I want to go to to catch my limit of fish. Mm -hmm. Okay? Brush is something I go to to cull one fish or two fish in the tournament. And so, therefore, if I'm going to take the time to put out brush, I want it to hold one or two. I don't, I don't want it to hold a dozen, you know, uh, because surely if you're out there fishing in tournaments, you're going to get on a pattern to where you're going to catch your limit, okay? Now, if I have to say, uh, all right, like in the, uh, we, for some reason, we have a really, really good track record in September and October, and I really think that's some of the last time of the season where fish really relate to brush before they go into wintertime patterns and and really don't care if a piece of brush is there or not. But it's one of those deals, when I sink a brush pile or I put a pile of brush in there, I just want it to be a one or two cast deal. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to pull in there, bring my jig through it, one cast, and if he's there, he's going to bite it, and you're going to move on to the next one. Uh, but if it takes me 30 minutes to fish all over that pile of brush, then that's too much. And, like I say, Big piles of brush attract more keepers and lots of fish, and but it won't hold a big one. You know, one single log. How many times you you've got spots where there's one log, not good ones, but you've got one log, and every time you go there, you always catch one big one. Yeah, but only... but you won't catch two big ones there, and it might not catch. You might not catch two big ones there in a month's period, <laughs> but if you catch a big one there. It's always good for a big one, and, yeah. and and that's that's why I put in smaller stuff. A lot All of my logs are gone. Yeah, they are. They're gone. They've been washed away for years. Can't find just... them anymore. And the only thing I can think is inappropriate comments on unfiltered shows saying the only logs I had were this morning's constitutional, and that was the, I flushed them too. So <laughs> that was the only logs that were out there don't for my you, fishing. Don't you love when you we have to fish your... those out too? And that's when I have to call the bullet septic to take care of it because <laughs> there that's because the logs were jammed. I love so. I love showing up on some of my favorite banks you know, up the lake, and uh, and there's a bonfire going on the bank, and you're like, oh, what are they burning? Oh, yeah, it's your yeah, stuff. Yeah, my stuff. Yeah, yeah they I went mean, out I there and pulled your logs out. You know, I had a, I used to have a dock called beach. Magic Dock, and that's why I called it Magic Dock, because Magic Dock had one tree that was, like, off the corner. It was, like, in three feet of water, and I could chuck a spin a bit over that, and I caught, like, in two days, I caught, like, a six and a half and a six, which for me is, like, that's gold, man. Sure enough, went back, and things on the ground, winter drawdown. They drug it out with a mini skid steer, and they had a bonfire going. They were dancing around like Indians, and I was that's like, right. hey, yeah, you got to be kidding me. So, yeah, that happens. That's, I'll, I'll tell you something else on brush that a lot of people mess, mess up, as far as I'm concerned, is if you got a good structure spot, and when I say that, a good deep spot, uh, say a rocky point or a good ledge or, you know, just something like that, and you're catching fish off of it, don't ruin it with a piece of brush. Right. Leave it alone. If the fish are using it already, it's good enough. We're getting a lot of good but, tips on brush tonight. Yeah, you'll, so see, you'll see lots of people think, oh, well, I, I need to sweeten that up to keep them there. Right. No, they're there. Just 
Fish right. for them what's there. Unfiltered tip number four. Don't make a good fishing spot better because it's not going to help it. Now, sometimes they're it staying it there for a reason. Leave it alone. Catch a good fish. Go find unproductive water and throw it out there. My best friend, my best friend in the world, Dirk Slater, probably puts in as much brush as anybody on Lake of the Ozarks. And that's saying a lot because I know how much, how many chainsaws my son wears out in the year. But Dirk carries around a grappling hook on about 100 feet of rope. Mm -hmm. And if he pulls on one of his favorite deep spots and somebody's plopped a piece of brush out there, Dredge it off. He sends that thing, sends that hook down there and drags it off. I have seen many, many of a fight ensued on crappie fishermen because they'll be like on Truman or, or some southern Alabama lakes and they'll go out there and literally look for their brush and move it 100 yards to make it better for them. Oh, it, it's. And these guys, they, they get pissed now. You they, go. You go into you go into the Grand Glaze and and uh, everything is uh, what's Marcus's fishing partner Bill Davenport. Bill Davenport. Every pile of brush in there is Bill Davenport. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, dude, you have put a lifetime into putting in brush in the glaze because there's ten million of them in there. Which our upcoming podcast down the road, we're going to have some boating etiquette and some fishing etiquette and there dock owner etiquette, so that people know kind of what you should and shouldn't do. But I guess unfiltered tip number six on structure is once you drop into the lake. It's everybody's. <laughs> that's that's one thing that I as use. As bad as it sucks, it's everybody's. That's one thing that I use my live scope for. To find everyone else's find brush. Find everybody else's brush. You're the guy I hate. Well, that's okay. I don't mind. Now, I don't mind. I, and I don't get all sweaty putting it in either. You know, I just, that's right. Yeah. I turn on my live scope and I scoop around. I'm like, oh, there's. I don't know. I've seen you work a foot pedal and work right up over a sweat. There. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard for me to work up sweat in this day and age. I just really? don't. Just like you run the pedal. Yeah. I'm I let out. my sons do it, though. That's good. I'm, I'm bad about, you know, hey, bud, wouldn't you love to go put in some brush? And then I just go and drive the boat. You yeah, know, it's but. like, you, but I've heard you before. You said, hey, we need to go put in brush. And I hear your we. son go, what's this we? <laughs> that's right. You know, that's right. Are you French? Because, <laughs> <laughs> because there ain't going to be two of us doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you point and mark, like put it over there. They, they need help. They need to know things. That's you right. Know, and I'm there for moral support. Can I, can I give up your secret on how to weight down brush? You can. Tonight. All right, so here is, I'm going to call this the tip of the week. And the tip of the week I found the other the other week, it, it's been about, I shouldn't say of the week, it's been about three months ago. And um, Dion called me an idiot. And I kind of got ticked at it. And I thought about it later. I'm like, he's right. I'm pretty stupid because that was brilliant. You know, so all of my friends, all my fishermen I know, they cut their brush, throw it in a boat. They buy pontoons. They buy all this stuff. They go out and they get old dock blocks, and they get cinder blocks, and they get uh, septic tank lids, and they go pour concrete, and they make five-gallon buckets and put eyelets in them, and they do all this crap. And Dion looked at me, and he said, dude, that's, that's dumb. Don't do that. He said, all you need is roll duct tape. And I went, <laughs> I said, duct tape don't sink trees, dude. He said, yeah, but if you wrap them around a rock, you dumbass, they do. And I'm like, holy cow. You mean to tell me I can go down there and find some lay-down pieces of wood, some nice chunks of hardwood that have washed in the back of the cove, I can drag them out, go up on the shore, find a big-ass rock, wrap some duct tape around it, and sink it. And, he, and I said, how long would that hold? He said, longer than, than you'll be wanting to fish it. And I thought, that's true. That's pretty awesome. When Almost when, as awesome as the dancing worm last week, which, by the way, if anybody's watching online, look at this. I found, found some. some. Yeah, because <laughs> actually my girlfriend had to show, and she came up and she said, you've got to show me this because I don't believe it. And uh, let me see if I can hold it up there. That is the bait we were talking about last week. We're going to have to film that's, that. That's stretchy. Film it'll that do in it, the tank. It'll do it in my hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see? So this is a Senko look style, and they, they stretch way out. See that? But if you tie it into a little quick knot, I'm going to do this really quick here so you can see it online. I lay it in my hand, and it's not going to do it now. But in water, <laughs> it like, it'll just go nuts, and it'll come unwrapped, and it'll flip around, and it'll come untied. So, but didn't do it in my hand. Like, but I've, I've done this like 50 times. It's losing its stretchability. When, so, but that's that's the three X bait. Anyway, when I was got sidetracked. Sorry. When I was very young and very ambitious, you know, in bass tournaments, we would go to we would go to some of the lakes in the fall, and uh, and you know the first thing I would do, I, I I carried in my boat, you know, second thing basically after my toilet paper went in the boat, I would put my machete knife in there, three or four rolls of duct tape. So you could make it through the jungle? So I could, yes, yeah, so I could fight my way out of the jungle. That's right. But it's so I could put in brush while I was out there fishing, you know, and you pull in on a big flat area. Bass in the fall use a lot of flats. 
uh, because that's where the food's easiest to get to. They push them up shallow on them, and that's where they like to thrive. And uh, But a lot of times in flats, there's not a lot of cover. So, you know, I would go to some of these lakes around the country, and I would go cut me a little willow limb and get me a rock, you know, that big around, take my roll of duct tape, drop it in the lake. It's, it's brilliant. It's I would simple. It, it's easy. It's cheap. I would do it on my three days of practice right before the tournament. And there's lots and lots of good finishes that me and Dad had uh, was because of, you know, spending one whole day working. I thought it's because he was a better fisherman than you. Well, that that's the case, too. Because, you know, when you guys quit fishing and when he passed away, you know, your numbers aren't as good as they were oh, when you were no. fishing with him. I, so I'm just I saying, know you know, it's like, damn. Yeah. I know who the net guy was. It's yeah. all fine. I, I know your place. I uh, <laughs> I was I was at Lake Murray. and That's just me being mean. I'm sorry. No, I'll take it back. Right. I was at Lake Murray in uh, in South Carolina, and... Uh, and me and Lawson went out there. Lawson had qualified for the Junior World Championship. I'd quali for, qualified for the Forestwood Cup. And they have herring in that lake. And uh, and so when you're on the low end of the lake where the herring live, you have to chase them that way. Well, I don't like chasing schoolers because mm -hmm. schoolers are very, they're unpredictable. I mean, mm -hmm. one day they do, and the next day they're chasing, they're chasing a herring a mile away from where you found them. So it's real inconsistent. And I fished for three days, and boy, I had a terrible practice, and, and I had six days, and I called my dad. I, I told dad, I said, man, I said, this is going to be a miserable damn tournament. And he says, get away from those herring. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, they, don't, they live in the deep water. He said, go up the river. He said, go as far as you can go up the river, and he said, find you some fish. That way you've got something to fish for, you know, in a month, mm -hmm. a month down the line. And, uh, and I went up the river. Had a pretty decent day the next day. You know, caught a few nice ones. But what I found once I got up the river, not much in the water. Mm -hmm. So I called my oldest son, and I, I tell him, I said, you load up, you, two or three of your buddies. I said, bring everybody that's willing to come. And I said, get your butt out here. I said, we got two days left, and we are going to cut some brush. <laughs> him, and, him and my other son, Connor, they drove all night long to get to Lake Murray. They got there. When they got there, me and Lawson had already kind of started getting things in order, what we needed, and we brought about 100 roll of, rolls of duct tape, and <laughs> we had found some rocks and, <laughs> and stuff, and, and we had took them and packed them on the bank. That way we could go drive up on the bank, pick up what we needed, and take off and go put in two or three brush piles. And uh, let me tell you something. I got caught bigger than hell. I mean, there was a fisherman come out, and he's like, what in the hell are you people doing on the bank? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, we're putting in brush. And then they're like, holy crap, what a good idea, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there ain't no brush up I here, boy. <laughs> we put in, we put in, in, in two solid days of work, we put in 70 different piles that we could make one or two casts at and catch a fish off of. That's right. And I finished third in that tournament. And the only reason I didn't win is because I didn't put in if I'd had 10 more brush piles, I ran out before the last day. And like I say, they're only good for one or two fish. Right. But in the first three days of that tournament, I caught my limit off of them every day. And, and like I say, was leading the tournament going into the last day. And, and when I, you know, Dad was there, he was there working the show. And uh, he says, what are you going to do tomorrow? I said, I don't know. I'm out of brush. <laughs> I said, I have used up everything. And he says, well, he said, you caught some of them off of them the first day. He said, go back and try those again. And I only weighed in three the last day, but if I'd have had another ten brush piles, I would have, you know. And, that's, and of course, that's the first time that the Forest Wood Cup was worth a million dollars. Right. So, but anyways, it, it, it just, a little bit of hard work every now and then. You know, there's a reason that, that guys like Lawson, Dirk, Marcus Sikora, Guys like that here on Lake of the Ozarks, uh, the Cooks, the father and son team of, of Roger and, and uh, oh, I can't think of his son's name. But anyways, Corey, Roger and Corey, there's a reason they do well. They put in stuff. Mm -hmm. They put in stuff to where you're the only one throwing at it. <laughs> now, mind you, with live scope and stuff like that nowadays, people find it, right. okay? But at least you can go fish a piece of cover with great conviction because you're pretty sure you're the only for sure one that knows it's there. Right. You know, uh, and trust me, Lawson has 
showed me on live scope some of the sneaky stuff that some of them guys do and oh right. it's amazing where they yeah. put a pile of brush yeah you know to where other people can't find it so other people can't find it and see and here's here's my problem and you've seen this and i'm not going to describe it but i built what i feel is the perfect bass brush pile absolutely you've seen it i showed and you I, pictures of it and there's, I there's like some it. right behind this wall that, that i have built here's the problem i like to fish shallow and right now we're in winter drawdown so I can't really put them out there because they're going to stick out of the water and everybody's going to find them. And then, once they go, I think I think I need to wait till the water goes up and put them in, but then when they have a drawdown next year, they're all going to find them. But I have found this. Scope heads can't see plastic. Yep. Which I like that word. I'm going to use it forever Any, now. Anything. Because if you say live scopers, I like scope heads. Scope heads are not going to find those as good. And um, so I can stick them in the water right now. I can put them like right underneath the surface. But I still, it still to me is... I want them to be in that three to four foot range. Yeah. You know, where in the summertime I can flip up to them. And um, I put a few out, and I was so proud of myself when I threw them out there, and they were sticking out like half out. And I was like, crap. And this guy up on the hill and his dog, I mean, it doesn't matter. We're, it's like almost dark. We're in a Bentley pontoon boat. I took like three, and I'm going to be all stealthy, and nobody's going to see me. You know, it's almost dusk. We're having a cocktail. We're playing some soft music. I'm like, ease up here. And I just slid it out and dropped it in. And some guy in front of me goes, there ain't no fish over there. And I look up and there's a guy having a drink up on the deck. And I'm like, <laughs> you can't hide from people anymore. You just no. you can't. So, you know, you try to be we, sneaky and try to be stealthy. but We move ours. I, I, I'm if, not. If it's something up shallow. And, and, I am not doing that. And 99% of the time, the ones that really are a big key for me are in five foot or less. Right. And when the water level goes up and down, I go out and I but, move them. But the lake's down five feet. Oh, yeah, you can't put them out right now. Yeah. But this is the only see, I got time 50, of the year. I got 50 of those. I'm, like, so proud of them. I got 50 of them. But this they're, is like, the sitting only time of like the year. They're, like, little maidens all in a row, and they're, like, sitting behind the building here. And but this like, is the only time of the year when brush doesn't matter. They don't true, care about it. But I want to get them in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. I want to start the cycle, you know. Well, you're going to have to wait till April. <laughs> when, it, when it starts raining and then the water comes up. Which those listen, if, if you're listening all over the country... At Lake of the Ozarks, we have this like phenomenon that happens, and I think it's part of the FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulation Commission, and uh, they they do winter drawdowns. People can do seawall repairs. They can it kills off zebra yeah. mussels, it kills bacteria, blah 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 blah, whatever. But it's called Memorial Day of Miracle. The, yes. Memorial, the Memorial Day of Miracle is when the lake goes back up to 660 full pool. Well, I still want to catch April fish in my spots that I can't stick in there right now. It sucks. I don't, it's just not as important. It's, it's frustrating it's to me. It's not as important to me in the springtime, uh, you know, as it is in the fall and the summer. Right. You know, uh, you know, you fish primarily on the upper end of the lake. That's because the upper half of the lake. And I'm gonna tell you why. And just so we're clear, a, I am too lazy to go a long way. B, Dad and I are both getting older. And I don't like the, what's called the Lake Ozark Lumbar. Uh -huh. And that's like getting your ass beat Absolutely. and four-foot rollers coming back. And C, I'm too tight to spend the gas money. <laughs> so I like running like two miles either direction. And, you know, it's home waters. You know, we grew up up the river. We, we have that sure. mid-lake stretch. Absolutely. But our, our, our structure is gone. And, and, you know, nature took its course. You know, yep. that stuff just it disappeared. Current swept it away. You know, and, and we have good stuff. Wood, wood, you know, Woody erodes down in no time. It, it does. Yeah, it's it a couple seasons. A oh, yeah. You know, at least. Two, se two one seasons. One spring rain, though. And I'm going to tell you a story. Um, you know, we do. And if you guys ever want to come and listen to us live, we have, we have a seating out here. We have, we have people here tonight that are watching. Sure. I have a really good friend of mine I used to fish professional crappie tournaments with. And I'm going to tell you this. Uh, concerning structure, we thought we were the baddest, badasses in the planet on crappie fishing. We went and found this river. And it was one of the, one of the river arms coming into the lake here. And... Um, we went out and we put brush up and down this thing, and we were like, when the spawn comes on for crappie, we're going to go up here and we're going to smoke them. I mean, because nobody fishes up the higher end, like Little Niangua, Big Niangua. Yeah. So we go out there and we spend a couple of days and we put this brush out, and it was, a, it was amazing brush, good stuff. It's going to hold crappie. And then the spring rains came in and washed it all 10 washed, miles down the river. It was gone. It all out. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, you learn the hard way. Sure. But, but my point is that, you know, you put it out there, you do the work, it's not always going to work for you. Things, oh. things bad are going to happen, but you've got to put a lot out there. And it's, it's hard for the weekend warrior that wants to come up and do it. So, you know, be a scope head, go steal somebody else's brush. That's cool. 
But it's not hard to go down, and I guess this is where we're getting at. Go to the bank, grab you some duct tape, grab you a big rock, find you some driftwood, some big gnarly stuff, and sink it. It'll work for you within 30, 40 minutes. I right? had, wait, oh, absolutely. That's Before the day is out sometimes. I, uh, I do believe I, that. When I was, when I was young, younger, I missed the Bassmasters Classic one year by six, six ounces. And I was really frustrated. Well, on Lake the Ozarks in the summer, we don't have many big tournaments. But at that point in time, Truman Lake in the summer was having some pretty big tournaments. And, uh, you know, my dad told me, he says, oh, if you're pissed, you got to practice your trade. Mm -hmm. He said, you can't do it here on Lake the Ozarks because we don't have anything to fish for. No, no good money tournaments in the summer, right. you know, besides a night tournament. And, and right. But during the day, you just don't do it. Well, I didn't want to just totally turn into a night fisherman. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go to Truman. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he said, guess what? Truman's clear full of trees. He says, you have to give them a place different from what they're used to seeing. Right. And I spent one whole week, and I ended up putting in about 90 brush piles, all small, all to make one or two casts to fish. But I put in 90 brush piles. And I maybe, now, now mind you, that summer, Every, a lot of people, a lot of different people ask you, you know, hey, what was your greatest season as far as making money that you ever that you ever had? That was my greatest season ever. Mm -hmm. I made more money right here than I did if I would have went to the Bassmasters Classic. And uh, but it was all because of about a week's worth of real hard work of putting in mm -hmm. brush, putting it in the right places where everybody wasn't looking for it. But it was one of those deals that. It was it was new. People mm -hmm. people are fishing a whole lake full of woods mm -hmm. and putting in brush. That just gave them something different to stand on, you know. Yeah, it's it's really unusual because when you come when you come to your home waters after you've been all over the country, and and we've both been fortunate to see a lot of, of waters. A lot I haven't seen half of what you've seen, but I've seen I felt like I've seen a lot. I've been on thirty or forty different lakes in the country. And it's it's so amazing when you go to those standing timber lakes and you go to the grass lakes. And you go to those lakes that have just unbelievable structure and so many different things, and you come here and there's, n I mean, really, there's nothing. Yeah. You know, you have to learn, you have to learn to read the banks, and you have to learn the transitional waters, and you have to see what other people put in and put your which, own in. And which makes, makes you a better angler, anyways. It, it, it does, it does. But man, dude, I'm telling you right now, if I can make hydrilla or something grow in this lake, oh. and if I didn't go to jail, I'd plant it in every freaking corner I could find. You bet. I, I would. It'd be so there's awesome. No there's so nothing awesome. you can put in the lake better than grass. It'd be worth bailing out on. You yeah. know? Oh, it really it's, would. It's crazy. Let's we, put some invasive species in the I have, Let's do it. I encourage everybody out there. I have brought my live well. Do it. I have brought my I'm live well full of milfoil and hydrilla a mm -hmm. hundred times on, on Lake of the Ozarks. And nobody will ever understand until you get to a good good fishing yeah. trip in it. And it's like, yep. holy crap. Tulies. You ever heard of that term? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I was out in Clear Lake, California, and we got into black crappie and tulies. And I'm like, dude, if we had tulies in this lake, oh my gosh, it'd be it, good. It, so it's, good. It's pretty amazing how green stuff in the water just makes the difference. I know. I mean, but, it, but, but green plastic doesn't do the same thing. <laughs> no. It just doesn't. I, I mean, I, I would hope it would, but it doesn't. But anyway. plastic, plastic takes a little while. And when I say that, um, scope heads can't see it. What you said, they can't see PCV either. That, that's right. P, and, well, PVC. PVC. PC, PC, PCP or PCV? Yeah. <laughs> PCP is that those stuff guys, that makes you dream weird. Yeah, that's right. PC, PV, those guys on Woo! Kentucky Lake. PVC, white they make, a, they make a lot of their stuff out of PC. Well, and, and Kentucky PVC. Lake Corps, the, the Corps of Engineers do it too. They put it in the back of all the coves sure. and, and they mark them with a big sign. But, because that, when I didn't know how to fish, that's where I would But those guys out on those, out, on, out in that open, you know, open water out on that structure stuff, they put in a lot of that stuff because you can't see it. All right. You can't see it. So, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things there too. So remember that. Scopers are... You know, until until the algae grows on it and it gets like That's a big right. muck. You know, those first couple seasons, you got a secret there. But then again, I don't think that they're gonna the fish aren't gonna relate to them as well. I'm not a big fan of white pipe. I really never have been. It's it's not the same as black pipe. It doesn't get as hot. It doesn't draw in the bait. Uh, it's fine. One, one Any, the, anything is better than nothing. Yeah. But not not my first choice. One of the big misconceptions on brush to put in too cedar. Cedar's not good for for a long time, and it's because it's got all that acid in the in the you know in the leaves and so gin be, before there's, you, there's gin and that's where that's where you know gin comes from i think that that's part of one of the berries really yeah that little blue little berry on cedar tree i think they can extract are you lying? The, no 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 huh. 
It's something. I, our tech girl can look it up. I think she can Google it right now. I, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. there is something that comes out of, out of cedar trees that you can make gin out of. Huh. I'm pretty sure. But my dad said, okay, you want to put in some cedar? <laughs> Don't be stupid. Set it ablaze. Mm -hmm. Burn it and all that I green. was going to ask you that. That's it, true. It's like gasoline. When what about you set carbon it? that's left over? That black crap ah, that's on it there. It washes off. You set you set a piece of a piece of cedar on fire. Oh, man, now we're getting to a whole other conversation. You said washes. Sorry, it's kind of like spawned. Spawned. <laughs> well, we're gonna have that story another night. But yeah, it's it's, it's a hibbly thing. Wash and wash, and you but, know, uh, me and you, I. Am. You you set one ablaze, burns that stuff off in about ten seconds, and then it's ready to catch a fish. It's ready yeah. to hold a fish. I call it I call it, it wolf in a tree. Well, there you go. You heard that? You, yeah, because if you light it, it goes woof, yes, and it's gone. That's right. It's like, all right, go, boys. But that acid in any kind of pine and stuff like that, you know, I it just, it's not good for a fish immediately, you know, because once it gets in the water, it's kind of a foreign substance. You know? Now, while, while we're talking crop, it, while we're talking cedar, and I just want to say this because I've seen this on, with underwater cameras, guys, you can tether a cedar tree to a dock. Absolutely. You, know, you can tie it up like, where it's up and down, put a weight on the bottom of it, be it a rock, be it a, a concrete block or anything, and weight it. Because you'll see that a crappie will get in it like Dion's talking about. But when you have wave action and, and things like that, boat traffic, your dock will move up and down. Those crappie will move away from it, but they'll suspend just a few feet from it. When it calms down, they'll move right back in, kind of in and out. It's it, like a pulse. And it doesn't, it doesn't hurt a thing. It, it's, so don't sink it all the way to the bottom because it'll lay over inside. It'll break down, and they won't relate to it as good as one that I, I believe that's tethered onto a dock. It, when they when you tie something off to your dock, you just have to keep one thing in mind. If the dock moves, it's not going to hold a big bass. You know, and, correct. And, and when I say I'm that, talking crappie though, he, crappie different yep, story. Different story. But yep. a big bass does not like his stuff moving, and correct. that's why when I put something in, I put plenty of weight on it. You know, if if I'm going to put in a piece of cover, uh, that's another good tip. Travis, that's, Travis, mm -hmm. and those those concrete lids that go on septic tanks, mm -hmm. that's perfect. Got something to tie off to and everything, and yep. it's heavy. Yeah, you can sink your boat though if you're not careful because there's a put too many heavy. on there. Yeah, and we'll have right. him on the show too because he's definitely unfiltered. But it, we'll we'll have that. And as we go on, guys, we're getting closer. We're, we're three episodes in. We're going to bring some guys in and help us out a little bit. But you know, I'm kind of liking this so far. I I'm going to tell you right now. I think it's all. I talked it, to uh, I talked to John Neparadney today. There you go. You know, and if you guys don't know who John is, you're missing out. He is a legend in sports writing. Uh, in, in the BSS world, and, and he's been in the Lake of the Ozarks forever. Uh, one of the greatest outdoor riders in the history of, of fishing, really. Yes. And uh, I invited him on this week, and he's, he's contemplating because, you know, he's kind of uncomfortable with the unfiltered because, like most people, uh, they want to say what they're thinking, but they're yeah. scared to. You know, and that's – and the, it's, it's going to be okay, people. It's all right. He's had to write um, – he's, he's had we'll to write – We'll shut down if we get sued, so it, it's all had, good. He's had to write politically correct stuff his whole yeah, life yeah you know and and i'm not saying we're not politically correct because we don't really no, we are we just tell the we just tell the truth in our own opinion yeah the truth in our own opinion that's right that's a t-shirt i tell the truth in my own opinion that's right i like that i like that so did you look up my gym berry it can be used thank you so you had to look so it can it can be used but what, what is the blue, what is the little blueberry on a, on a cedar tree called i think it's it's not a cedar berry. Anyway, that she doesn't count. Our tech girl's fired. We're gonna find somebody else. So anyway, I, I think it's I think it's called a dangleberry. No. No, that's not it. It's not? No. <laughs> you're thinking about something when you're cleaning your kid off after his diaper gets dead. No, that's dingle. <laughs> I, I thought it was a dangle. So anyway. Cedar berry. Cedar berry. All right, so if you want to make homemade hooch, I think you can do it with, with a I'm thinking that cedar berry. I'm thinking that one of these old hillbillies come in and told you about that. I don't know. I mean, I grew up making balloon wine, so... <laughs> there you, you know, go. You know how that works, right? No, I don't. I'm not sure I need to know. Here you go. Or, yeah, the, or the public. I'm going to tell you anyway, because I don't care. Balloon so, wine. Yeah, so you put you put whatever you want to make. If you want to make dandelion wine or grape wine or any of those kind of things, um, you can... Um, hang on, let me get this. My text message booped off here, and I don't really care about this. And this guy knows we're on a podcast. If so you need to answer, be, go right ahead. No. Thank no, you, He doesn't count. Um, the hell were we talking about? Uh, yeah, wine, balloon wine. Thank balloon you. Balloon wine. Yeah. So you, what we did? We use we use fruit, and so you, you pulverize all your pulverize, That's whatever. Okay. You, you you put a, a bunch of sugar in. I don't have the recipe in front of me. It's a lot of sugar. 
You got made, a lot of sugar. You made fun of me about spawning. Put it in a jar and a small neck and you put a balloon on it. Now, when the wine ferments, the balloon swells. So when it decelerates, then it's breaking back down as to where you don't poison yourself and die because you've drank poisonous wine. Because when it's in the fermenting process, it's got like a lot of like nasties. So when it when it decelerates, then you filter it and drink it, and it's like awesome. So awesome. I, you know, I grew up I grew up from some backwood family too. Yeah. You know, and I shouldn't say backwoods, but guys, I mean my, my dad had like nine aunts and three uncles and he had a couple uncles who lived off the land and we learned some really cool things from them. And um, you know, generally when somebody in the family passed away they made bloom wine. We, they went and dug their graves. I mean, it was it was kind of it was it was like a tradition thing, and uh, blue wine was amazing. But but I've turned out that you get so drunk that you forget to dig. You know, yeah. you don't get so tired digging the hole. So it, it helps a lot. So, but that's that's been a long time ago. Now they use excavators, so it's you know kind of takes my the fun out of blue my wine. My wife's actually pretty cheap. You can go to Dollar General buy wine. I mean, Ooh. come on! I love you know I really love wine, but I'm not a, like a wine snoot. Yeah. I don't know like good wine from bad wine, but I do know that if you drink a bottle of it, it's good no matter what. Yeah, because you bottle, just kind of for, forget it doesn't matter. Whole bottle past makes that. it better. Yeah, yeah. I, I think my rule of thumb is is uh, white wine with chicken, red wine with anything else, and too much wine makes you sleep really good. Yeah, that's true. So that's, that's about it. So I do the same thing with just straight whiskey. Yeah, I didn't mean to get off that. Brown, so brown stuff is good for me. Right, brown. Brown whiskey. It's Crown Royal tonight. By oh, the way, I like that one. Um, I still have some really high dollar stuff in the back. I'd like to try would, that. We're, we'll get there. I would drink along with you, but I reach a point pretty quick where I can't function. Somebody has to be the filtered side. That's of the group. right. So, so here's somebody some, has to keep this train on the track. So I'm going to throw some ideas out here, and then we're going to wrap it up for the night. Because um, I think the brush conversation was good. Uh, I liked it. Uh, that's good, people, right? Yeah, I, I thought it was all right. Know. And they still don't know. No. You know, they don't. I don't know. And they're not going to take and, the and you know what? To do at, it. At the end, yeah, and at the end of the day, on the unfiltered side is, I know, guys, you're lazy. You know, you're lazy. Uh, you're not going to do it. And you really, you listen to it, and it's like, it's a really good idea. But soccer practice for the kids is coming up. And then you That's work right. all week, and then you pulled overtime, and you're pissed off about that. And then you're going to fish a tournament this weekend. Sunday comes around, you go to church, do your thing. After that, you got to cook dinner and go to the in-laws for, you know, Easter weekend, which, by the way, is coming up next weekend. It's great. And you're not going to do it. There's barely enough so, time to go fishing. So I guess what you need to do is just like start start out first, the obvious places. Go down, go take your boat, use your side imagery, be a scope head, do whatever you want to. Look for docks with sinks on them. Number one, that's the clean stations are the, are the first one. You're going to find crappie structure there. Nine out of ten times you're going to find it. Go out to secondary points, main lake points. Um, just kind of cruise around. You'll find it. it it's yeah. out there. You it's know, not you'll, hard you'll to find, find some. And here's the deal. And I guess that's a good thing. If you find it, fish it out. Then the good guys that put in the hard work can go put more in for themselves, and then it's going right. to make more for the rest of us. So that's that's good too. I um, I have a, I have a little bit of a funny story. We went to Truman Lake. Is it short time. or long? It's pretty short. All right, go ahead. I, I went to Truman Lake and and I pulled up on one of my favorite points, and I, I made a ca cast. And as soon as I made the cast, I'm like, holy crap! I'm in a piece of brush. And Marcus Score pulls up to me right then, and he's like. I just put that in 10 minutes ago. I said, ah, 10 minutes I, ago. I, I, could, I found it on my first cast. <laughs> you know? He's like, holy crap. He says, now, I heard, I heard, um, since, we're, since we're back on the brush conversation, because we got off the line, um, in, on Truman Lake, and correct me if I'm wrong, and there's some guys out here that would know this, um, you can't fish inside the No Wake Buoys of State Parks, Correct. Like uh, around the commercial docks and things, you have to stay outside of no wake buoys, I believe. I don't know. That's no wake buoys, uh, or in inside. So the, many feet from a gas dock is. So, but yeah. Well, it's it's fifty feet, like in it's most like, rules in most tournaments. But like I think fifty feet from a gas. Pump. I think some of them have like some really weird rules where you can't actually fish those docks. Or, they might. Or, but I I did hear that. Here's another. Here's one of my favorite tips. It happens a lot, at Truman. Because there's a lot of standing... Truman Lake is a, is a lake that adjoins at the upper end of Lake of the Ozarks. For those that are tuning in and listening that might be listening to the podcast, not, not watching this live, they're driving down the road. It's, it's an adjoining lake, and it's totally different from this lake because it has standing timber, it has deadfall. You know, it's, it's completely different. However, it reminded me of a great tip. Lake of the Ozarks has thousands and thousands of no-wake buoys, as do Truman Lake around their state parks and their accesses. It's a great place to sink brush because you can find it. 
it's really easy to find. So, you know, one time, and I'm going to share this with you, um, I had this really cool idea, and it actually worked for about a year until I got caught. But um, I made a, a fake trout line. Most of the really cool stuff is. I made a fake trout it's line. It's very deal. cool until you get caught. I took gallon jugs, I marked them, I spray painted them orange, put my name, my conservation number on it, and I made three or four jugs out in a row. And I, there was no trout line there. I sunk brush piles on them so I could line up to make my cast. It was awesome yeah. until I actually cashed a couple of checks, which is rare for me, but it was like super badass spot where it worked. And the people said, dude, don't you get you know, like concerned about fishing around trout line? I'm like, oh, no, that's all cool. And then they went and checked me, and they found out that, that it <laughs> was not. Tied on there's nothing tied There's nothing tied to it at all. It was <laughs> brush piles. So be creative with your brush. I mean, it's, you can do really cool stuff, and that was, that was my um, really cool tip that I had that no one else has done. But Lake of the Ozarks, that has been done quite a bit that's that's not new no no i thought it was cool i've seen guys tie them off to no wake buoys and suspend them up no, i'm talking the about the trout line thing yeah oh yeah trout line that's, that's great a good idea. one right yeah. do you remember that so yeah. you remember that one that was Absolutely. mine I'm, I'm gonna own that which by the way i have a term that i think that i own that i think is going to be in the dictionary down the road it's called text tacular text tacular that's somebody who texts really really fast on their phone they're like they're not amazing. They're not spectacular. They're textacular. There you go. And I'm going to coin that phrase out there because that that's mine. I made that one up. So just so we know. So here's what we got. Um, I'm going to throw some things by here. And, and for those listening, it's askrealtalk at gmail.com. If you have some questions, we'll answer them. Um, if it's outside the what we've talked about, some ideas throwing up on the next couple of weeks. Um, oh, these are all what I feel. I can't talk about those. Now, we had we did have a conversation the other night. We got done last week. We we really went unfiltered and um we we did. Yeah. You know, it was a bad week and some people are just mean, but it happens. Um so you work in retail. Yeah, it it does. Um so let me throw this by you and see what you think. You say yes or no, okay? Okay. Today's touring youth. When is it time to wrap up your dreams? Now, what my thoughts are is you know, there's a lot of people out there that want to be a professional angler, and you've done it. Your family's done it. I've tried it, and when we had that conversation. Should we have a conversation on what what it's really about? You know, what if people have never done it. You know, we can bring in some guys that have fished tournament trails before, but it's it's a lot harder than people think. Should we have a conversation about when enough is enough? Yeah, that that would be a good conversation. Because the truth is not something everybody wants to hear, mm -hmm. and and it's it is unfortunate that we live in a we live in a world where you know it, it's very deceiving. You know what you see out there. You know all these elite series anglers and MLF anglers and stuff like that. So that's it, a yes. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to move on. So that's a, that's a yes conversation. Spoon billing, snagging, is it considered fishing? Yes or no in this conversation. <laughs> I, I, like, I like to eat, I like to eat them. So yeah, does it matter? Yeah. Is, is snagging fishing? That's that's the question. Should we have a conversation on it? You know, you know, in the th sure, absolutely. okay, okay, okay. Now I have one here. I have story. We, we're gonna have story time once a month. You know, and story time. I have a couple in here, but um, I gotta tell you a story that um, Dion and I have both experienced something that's happened, which was a national tragedy. And it happened on two different states of the country at two different times. That's definitely story time, right? Sure. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Don't give it up. And there's actually three. Because you have us. We, we, we were driving down the road one day. Yep. We were actually we were on the highway, and we were driving on Highway 5 South. And, and for those who are listening on podcast, Highway 5 South, Lake the Ozark, goes straight into Arkansas. And in Arkansas, everybody who lived in Missouri, um, Denny Brower, Chad Brower, Dion Hibden, Guido Hibden, everybody, Drove Highway 5 south to one location, which is the only place they drove to Arkansas once a year, and that was Ranger. Ranger Boats. That's correct. So everybody knows Highway 5 upside down back. So we're driving down Highway 5, we're heading down south, and we start telling stories. And I said, I saw this national tragedy happen while I was fishing. And you said, Yeah, I saw this national tragedy happen when I was at this state. And I was like, Holy crap, we've both seen this at the same time in different, different states, different years. And he's like, and I was here when this happened. So on those dates, I think we should have those story times. And that's, guys, I'm going to tell you right now, it's freaking amazing. Stories are, are really amazing. That's really good. 
Um, are guides worth the money? Should we have that conversation? Sure. Okay. Um, the financing of fishing. You know, what you spend versus what you bring versus what you buy. Should we have that conversation? We can. Should we talk about your classic win? We can. Is the crappie industry dead? <laughs> ah. Is bass fishing next? Are, are we going to have a whole show on that? Uh, yeah, we could. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, sure, we sure that's could. That's the thing. You could. Mm -hmm. um, how to be an effective pro staff angler. Sure. We should talk about that, shouldn't we? I can do it. Because today's youth is not doing a very damn good job. You know, they're really not. And I, I don't care. You can be mad. Uh, all future episodes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, live scope trophy fisherman. Uh, I don't want to talk about live scope at all. Guys who trophy... Here, here's, my, here's where I'm going with this. For 20 or 30 years, everybody went to California and they followed Big Bertha. Sure. They wanted to catch the world record largemouth bass. And all of a sudden that went off, like nobody talked about it anymore to catch a world record. But with live scope, you should be able to. you right. But these guys that are going trophy hunting fish are fishing smaller controlled water. They're not fishing big water and they're not finding those big fish. Should we have that conversation of why, 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 why is anybody sure. using this technology to find those big fish? And, and what happened to the world record largemouth bass? You know, that, the, that chase kind of got quiet. It's, it's the same situation. You can see it. Mm hmm. They they never caught Bertha ever that she wasn't on the bed. That's right. They there was years and years of people fishing that pond, and she never got caught unless she was on the bed spawning. Right, and they and they track That's them. That's the only critical time in guess, a bass's life. I guess maybe we should have a conversation about spawning fish because we both know that typically, eh, it's not even typically it's fact that big female goes to the same place every year, ninety nine percent of the time. Yes. Correct. Correct. Even if you Unless move she's a fish, relocated. Yeah. If she's relocated, and generally, dominant fish theory applies, she takes yep. the, the closest nest with the smaller fish and boots her off, and yep. then she stays there. Yep. But then we have this whole conversation if she goes all the way back or if she stays there, but that's a whole other show. But we definitely want to talk about it, right? Okay. What do you think? Is that good? That sounds good. Um, let's see. What else do I have? Um, tackling tackle, the right tackle to use at the right time. That's boring. I don't really like that. Um, okay. Here's one that we'll have a battle over. All right. This is going to piss you off. You ready? I'm ready. All right, so how to compete against a regional angler, okay? Should guides be allowed to fish, and should pros be able to fish down the food chain? Because we're going to differ on that. We're going to, I promise you we're going to differ on yeah, it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, we're going to do it. But that's okay, that's why it's unfiltered. That's right, dock owner etiquette, boat owner etiquette, I think those are we all good. We have not cussed each other yet. Oh, we're going to have some arguments. That's oh, all yeah. good. That's, that's all happen. good. So I think we went way over tonight, but I think that's a good good subject to kind of give you guys an idea of what we've got going down the line. Um, we've got some local fishing guides booked down the road. They're going to come in and talk with us. We've got some uh, tackle industry guys. We've got some rednecks. We've got some some crappie guys. I mean, we've got some some good guests that are coming down the pipe to, uh, to visit with us, so we're excited about that. It ought to be a great. I mean, I don't know how long our season lasts, but. Every Wednesday night. <laughs> Every Wednesday night at Every six. Every Wednesday night we're going to come up with so something it's new. It's good. And if, if, you're, if you're watching us live, thanks for watching. And if you want to uh, listen to us later, we're on Apple. You can find us at Real Unfiltered Talk on our Apple podcast. And we're also on Buzzsprout. You can find us there. As well as these live streams are live streams are re-aired on YouTube. So subscribe to uh, YouTube on Real Unfiltered Talk. And we thank you so much for tuning in. And that's all we've got for this week. Dion, you got anything you want to add? No, I'm good. That's that was a good we show, did not, I think. We, we didn't do the shameless plug, but really there's uh, nothing really to plug tonight. Some sort of chainsaw or something? I guess or, the only thing I've got is... Or my machete name? Let's, or, let's just thank Brian Sosage Outdoors for having the facility for us. And, um, and for the sound system that I put on the company credit That's card right. that they'll find out about next week.